I'm just, I'm just going to finish on something that's um, a bit a bit of a taboo subject, okay? But it's not a major issue you're going to find when you organise, which is difficult political people. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to do a little chart here. So usually, usually find like people, most of us in this room, is we're really political, but we're really practical, right? Because we want to get some things done, okay? And then. Below us in the first corners, there's another group of people that are really political and don't want to get things done because they're so political. Right? <laughs> and, 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 and we can separate those people out in a minute. And then below that, the sort of this is like times a thousand times bigger. Those are those are those. That's the one percent of the population that are shitting themselves about the political situation. They really want to do something, well they're not actually that political, you see what I mean? And uh, this is probably the single biggest reason like movements get into a, a problem, is that these people really want to get stuff done, and they go down here to try and involve these people, and these people basically grind it to death, okay? <laughs> For very good reasons, which is going to make you think, yeah. So when you say political, do you mean political? Okay. Well, I give you, I'll give you the main sort of, I give you the main tribes, right? Oh, right. That do this over the last thirty years, right? And you're going to squirm when I say it because I'm all these people just for the for the, for the issue, but so maybe this is the most controversial thing to say. But there's, there's different political tribes in our society that want want to basically get everything perfect before things happen. So, uh, so there's extreme veganism. The big is a big issue. Extreme hard left viewpoints. Extreme intersectionalism, which is, you know, we need to be all perfect and all that sort of stuff. Um, there's another one. The hard right. Yeah, in the modern analysis, you get no, no, no hard what left. I, what, what I mean here is that people will say you can't do that. You can't do that until that is sorted out. You see what I mean? And often they're right. So, for instance, like, like some vegans will say, you can, we can't have a movement until we've made, I'm, I'm exaggerating, right? We can't have a movement until everyone is vegan in the movement. You see what I mean? Or some people will say, we can't have a movement until we make clear that capitalism has got to disappear on day one. I'm exaggerating. Yeah. Or they'll say, we can't have a movement until we have diversity in some extreme sort of sense. Okay? So, and there's another one. Uh, anarchists. <laughs> so, we can't have a movement until we're all totally participatory. Okay? You know, we can't have that much hard selling for more than two minutes, that sort of thing. Okay? So, the serious point about this is that all these points of view are right, but all the most effective movements have a central concept, and that concept is balance. I balance the pragmatic need and the ethical imperative to change society versus the need to be eternally ethical, as you might say. Can you say that again, please? So the balance, the balance uh, sort of conundrum, as it were, is to be effective externally as a movement because that's obviously a moral imperative. We need to get into London and close it down and change climate change versus being ethically consistent. Okay? So you can see movements historically that go out of balance one way or the other, you see what I mean? So for instance, you might have like the Leninist movements so that basically say, right, we're going to take down the state. And everyone has to do exactly what the three men at the top say. So obviously that's in balance, you see what I mean? Or on the other extreme, we have people saying we're not going to be able to move until you know we've got everything sorted on making sure that everyone's vegan, let's say, for the sake of all. Yeah. So I'm not so to tell you where the balance is, but I think the mature orientation here is to understand that wherever you are, it's a mess. Do you see what I mean? Because real life is messy. And at some point you're going to have to say to those these people here that yes, we've got this policy, and we've got that norm, and that's what we're doing, and it's not perfect because we're trying to change society. And most people are fine with that, but maybe 20% of people in this group will 
basically out, they will inadvertently destroy what you do because they're not actually interested in political effectiveness. They're interested in a pure approach which makes them feel good. And I'm not necessarily saying they're bad people, by the way. I'm just being sociological about it. So a strategy around this. A lot of people make the mistake of going, well, you might make this mistake, of thinking, right, you're going to go back to Leeds or something, and you're going to have a meeting with all these groups, right? Representatives of all these groups. And all these groups will be going, have you done that yet? Have you done that yet? And all the rest of it. And you'll get clogged. So the name of the game is to bypass these people, or at least recruit the little bit of them to get it, and go down here. And that's how you manage to mobilize like a thousand people in three months. Yeah, by having a public meeting. And if the public meeting is constructed around participatory principles, you won't have the SWP guy standing up at the end. Everyone's feeling good, and he does a rant about how it has to be socialist, otherwise it's rubbish, right? which brings everyone down. This happens over and over again. And how you do that is you don't have a Q&A. Q&A is basically <laughs> encourage new people <laughs> and absolutists. Yeah, we, we all know this, right? I mean, you can have a Q and A if you're super confident, and yeah, and you're in a group of people that are generally like in the real world. But you can have a public meeting. Eighty percent of the people will be normal people, in inverted commas, who are basically interested in the issue, and twenty percent of people will be political absolutists, and they'll be there basically to appropriate your energy. So, so there's two strategies. One is to go to the general public, you have a general meeting in your university, or you have a general meeting in your town. That brings in all these people who are going to be fab because they're going to be practical. And if you do have a meeting, then you use participatory design to design out people that want to talk you up. Um, and if you think about this for something I just brought out, my last final point is the most successful, so the most successful progressive socialistic experiment in the world is the Mondragon cooperatives in Northern Spain, which involve like half a million people in housing blocks and workers' blocks. They have their own bank, basically where we all should be going if we're all sensible. And they built that over 40 years. The most amazing experiment. You can check it out. Can you show it again? Mondragon. Mondragon. Yeah, N-O-N, something like that. Yeah. Don't ask them to spell it in case I'm just um, and their central concept, the whole concept of that cooperative system is not socialism or you know, you know, doing the bad guys. Their central concept is balance. Because in practical, in a practical, in terms of practically creating a better world, everything comes down to balance. Because you you're you've got these different you've got competing logics and you have to like you have to like find that and sometimes you're gonna get wrong. But as long as you know that's the game, that's the that's the that's the structure of the problem. Then you're eighty percent there. You see what I mean? So you're not getting sucked into thinking one logic is more important than another logic. Okay, so we're going to have a break, pee, and <coughs> drinks, and everyone needs to get up because I don't want to sit down where you were. We've evolved in extinction rebellion. So, <coughs> so the, the good news is is we sort of know how to do it. <laughs> Which is cool. Um, uh, so it's a matter of getting on with it. Uh, this is half the battle. Alright, so I'm going to do a sort of massive organising situation here. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll just run through it, sort of regress into top down communication. Sorry about that. It was great at the beginning, but it got really dictated, which at the end. Anyway, right, so, and then what, we'll, what I think we'll do is I'll just go through it, it's really exciting, and I think it's great. And, and then we can talk to each other and describe the points I'm making. So, and then we'll get it typed up, yeah? We'll get it typed up as we go along. Um, and then we'll have some break. Uh, no, after that, I'll make a few, uh, an emotional call for action. Before one o'clock, <laughs> and then you can have lunch, and then we'll get on to the nitty gritty. I'm only yeah. possible to have 40 minutes for lunch, so if you order some better food coming in, um, sorry, better food coming in, say, we're going to pop back. It's great. Tell me more.
Frida's gone. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we, we're only going to finish him at one, if that's okay. Yeah. Can we have 40 minutes for lunch then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. yeah let's, let's work on work on that. Um, I forgot to say on the previous section that two books to read or two sources are there's a book called Influence: The Psychology of Persuasion. Now this is another nasty capitalist book, but fantastic read, very readable. It's based, this guy did a PhD on, on how people are persuaded to do things. Uh, from, you know, anyway, just read it. It's great. What is the art of persuasion? It's uh, the psychology of persuasion. It's a classic in the field. Sounds like Max Yeah, it's variations on the theme, but he's um, he's a nice guy. Uh, anyway, read that. <laughs> the second thing you can read, which obviously is total self-promotion, is what I've written on radical think tank. If you go onto the website, I've, I've done a paper on how to organise meetings and why they work, uh, which is my award-winning research. <laughs> so uh, you, can, you can check that out. What's it called? The right people think tank? No, uh, the radical think tank. If you look on the internet, you can just download Thinkspedia. There's also a document on there on uh, how to win. Uh, and that's, uh, that gives some of the, some of the ideas okay. that have been going through. Okay, sorry. Yeah. If you allow yourself short of time, you couldn't dedicate to reading the whole book. Would a summary of the book be if you could find it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, I think there's some people that are sharing information about all this. Someone could initiate that. Because what we want is a resource, a resource file, don't we, of when you should do it. <laughs> yeah, so we've got up with basically, you know, the the educational resources. And obviously, I mean there's loads of things, there's loads of YouTube things. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want to read the book, you just look on YouTube and someone's done a video of it, right? I try and make those the things you suggested as a pack of resources for yeah. the Yeah. The stuff on the meeting is only about ten pages or something, so that's reasonable special. Um Okay. So, who's the author of the influence book? Actually, who's the author of the first book? I don't know, you just type it into Google, you'll find it. I don't know what the name is. Okay, so. So, the point, the point of what we're doing today is to try and make ourselves into generalists, right? And it's generalists that are going to change the world, not specialists. In other words, what we need to do is to be really good at a whole load of different things. You've got to be able to be nice to people. You've got to be able to run meetings, you've got to be able to organise a locality, and in this last section, you have to really know how society changes, right? Because you can be shit hot at all this, but unless you're doing something that brings in the goods, it's just whatever, right? It's a personal exercise, right? So the good news is, is there's people that have been researching, not that many, because there's no money in it. Researching how to bring about revolutions and rebellions successfully by doing historical research. Okay, so they're not sitting in a room getting all ideological. They're using social scientific methods to go around the world and say, what are the factors that bring about radical changes in society? Okay.